The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. From sea to sea to sea, Canada's 44th general election is now headed for the home stretch. So, what are voters in Ontario looking for? And what does Polly, the artificial intelligence pollster, have to say about it all? We examine all that tonight. Also, Nam Kiwanuka finds out what's needed for a safe and productive back to school as the pandemic disrupts a third academic year. It's Tuesday, September 7th, and that's tonight on the first episode of our sweet 16th season here on The Agenda. Well, here we are, two weeks less a day until Canadians go to the polls to vote in the 44th general election. Ontario is, of course, the big prize. It's almost impossible to win government if you don't win the majority of the seats in this province. But we are a big place, and the issues may be resonating differently in different regions. Let's find out. We welcome, as is our custom, from furthest away to closest to our studio, starting in the nation's capital with Erin Kelly. She's the CEO of Advanced Symbolics, Inc. And Susan Delacourt, national columnist for the Toronto Star. In Windsor, Ontario, Emma Richet, associate professor of political science at the University of Windsor. And in North Bay, Ontario, David Tabachnik, professor of political science at Nipissing University. And it's great to have all four of you with us for our first program here in our Sweet 16th season here on TVO. Before we uh, dive down um, to, you know, hit on some of the issues, uh, we got to hear from Polly first. So, Aaron, just start us off by giving us uh, the state of play. What are the polls saying in the province of Ontario today? Uh, in the province of Ontario, well, it, it, across the country as a whole, it's a dead heat between the Liberals and the Conservatives. The Conservatives are slightly ahead. Ontario is very much reflective of that. But it's really anybody's election right now. I think what we're definitely headed for, though, is a minority government. Can you extrapolate a seat count from what you have inferred from those numbers? Yes, we're seeing across the country about 142 seats for the Conservatives and 134, I think it is, for the Liberals. Um, with a number of swing ridings that could that could change that at any time. So uh, do I infer from that that the Conservatives will also win more seats in the province of Ontario? Uh, the province of Ontario, I, uh, they're, it's... It's, Ontario's up for grabs, is what I would say. Okay, good enough. Well, let's acknowledge we're on TVO right now, O for Ontario. And therefore, we tend to focus on this province more than we do the rest of the country. But it is an empirically provable fact that if you don't win the majority of the seats in this province, you're probably not going to win the government. And I've just been nerdy enough over the weekend to do a little number crunching on this and go back 40 years for the last 13 general elections to check that out. And Sheldon Osman, our director, if I can get you to bring up that graphic there... Okay, here it is, and I'm going to go into just a little bit of detail here for those who are listening on podcasts and who can't see it. But let's go back. 2019, the Liberals won the most seats in Ontario, and they won government. 2015, Liberals most seats in Ontario, and they won government. Before that, 2011, Conservatives most seats in Ontario and win government. And it's the same all the way back to 1979. Whoever wins the most seats in Ontario wins government with one exception, and that's 2006, Stephen Harper's first election victory, but it was a minority government. The Liberals won more seats in Ontario, but the Conservatives won the right to govern. Okay, I put all that up there, Susan Delacourt, just to ask you, given that historical reality, should the Liber you know, should all the parties, frankly, be spending all their time in this province from now until the end of the campaign? Well, it depends, you know, go, to go to Aaron's point, uh, how much they can shake loose in those places. Um, the, the, even before this election came around, the Liberals, uh, Justin Trudeau's Liberals, were insisting or, or telling us that their big growth in this election was going to come in Quebec. So we saw a lot of the Prime Minister, the Liberal leader, we now call him, doing a, a lot of events in Quebec. But I would say you are going to see all the leaders, the, the major leaders anyway, uh, spending all their time in uh, a great deal of time in Ontario in the last few days. Okay. I mean, I, I, I'm not saying that because we work here and, you know, our, our checks are from here. I'm saying that because if you look at the facts, this is where elections are won. And therefore, you'd think it makes a lot of sense to spend a lot of time here. If that's the case, 
Emma, come on in here. Tell us what, in your view, are the big issues that have been resonating in southwestern Ontario that have got people talking, the leaders campaigning on, and so on. Well, in southwestern Ontario, uh, you have the highest, one of the highest unemployment rates in Canada, so jobs are definitely on voters' mind. And for Windsor in particular, the automotive sector is key for jobs. So you have uh, both the Liberal Party and the NDP who are making uh, specific promises with regards to the automotive uh, industry. But also, you can't underestimate the importance of affordable housing. Just in Windsor, in the last year, we've seen that the prices of homes have risen by 25%. So it's becoming really hard for Canadians in the area to uh, rent or buy a house. Okay, David, Northeastern Ontario, same question to you. What's resonating there? What are the leaders campaigning on? Yeah, we've seen a few visits from uh, the Liberal leader and the NDP. And uh, one of the things we're concerned about here in Northern Ontario and Northeastern Ontario is uh, out-migration, um, keeping people who live here to stay here, to work here. And so we're looking at the platforms, seeing things like uh, these pilot projects to bring immigrants to the region, as well as tax credits to allow uh, graduates to work in the region. So there's a mix of different policies and uh, policy planks in the various platforms that I think are of interest to this region. The other thing is infrastructure infrastructure. Uh, I think, generally speaking, we could say Northern Ontario is a little underserviced when it comes to infrastructure. We want better access to air travel and to rail. And during the time of COVID, of course, almost all of our air travel was cut off for a long period of time. And that's just not internationally uh, all over the place. We had to basically drive down to Toronto if we wanted to go anywhere on a plane. Hmm. All right, Aaron, I'm going to get you to come in and follow up on that by, and, and I'll set it up this way. Uh, y your organization does sort of deep dive, three month long, longitudinal polling to see whether or not, you know, an issue that's here today is gone tomorrow or whether it's got legs and people are really still talking about it and engaging on it. What have you discovered so far about what issues are really sticking out there? Yeah, great question. So we're seeing, of course, what everybody's mentioned here, the economy, uh, jobs, housing, but add to that basic income, which we haven't heard any of the um, candidates talk about. We see people talking about that online. Climate crisis is, is up there right after the economy. Abortion, interestingly enough, which has been brought back in into this election. These are also issues that people across the province are talking about in the highest numbers. Abortion in what respect? Well, in, in, in both respects, we're seeing it across the political spectrum, both on the far right and the left. So pro-choice uh, and pro-life, very engaged. And But mostly on the pro-choice, uh, because of what happened in Texas, that has ignited people's fears that, that those types of laws could be brought in here. All right, Susan, I'm just going to ask you a very neutral, open-ended question. What has this election been about in your view? You know, I wrote in the paper today that I actually believe this is a mental health election. Uh, and I'm not saying that lightly. I think that whether it's those angry protests around uh, Trudeau or whether it's just the, the tone of the whole debate, the, the constant threat of a fourth wave of COVID, that I actually believe that this election, like the pandemic, has exposed sort of the fragile emotional state of the nation. I think that it's... Uh, I, I think this is a rough election, and I think it's, um, I've never seen one in which the, the question of whether we're having an election, why we're having an election has lingered so long. I think that that goes to the fact that people are feeling very frustrated. So all the issues sort of raised here, I think, cluster into one thing. I think we will remember this as a, um, a, a very fragile, precarious, uh, emotional election for the, the electorate. I'm going to follow up with you, Susan, because uh, one thing I certainly remember is the column you wrote on the 31st of August after the protests that took place, protests if we want to call them that, in Bolton and Cambridge in Ontario. And here's what you wrote in that column. You said, this crowd, in short, looks ungovernable. 
Questions of how to treat the people in it during an election don't seem half as important as what to do with them when the voting is all over. They aren't just at the fringe of politics. They're a democratic mutation of free speech. I don't know how many elections you've covered, Susan. I'm going to guess it's, you know, probably somewhere from 10 to 12. Is it 10? It's 11. 11, okay. Um, is this the ugliest you've ever seen it? Yes. Yeah. I've seen, you know, there have been protests, and I think, it, you know, there's been an attempt to say, you know, every, every prime minister has had angry people around them, too. What these people are saying, and I, I think you have to actually see one. I'm glad I saw one in Cambridge. You, you have to see what these people are saying. And you have to go into the crowds, and it is—it's disturbing. Um, I do worry about what this fringe is going to do if if Trudeau does manage to sweep through with a majority, a minority. I do worry about what Aaron O'Toole would do with them. They—they're uh, not deferential to the police, they're not deferential to government, and they're very, very angry. It looks—it looks very Trump-like. Uh, if I may say. And, uh, you know, it, it escalates all the time. For the purposes of this show, it's it's worth noting, and I was talking to a Quebec colleague this morning about this, they're not, it's, a, it's an Ontario thing. There, there's a little bit happening in BC, but not, I'm told, with the magnitude that they are in Ontario. And I think that's a distinguishing factor of the province, this campaign, too. It may be that this little group is better able to travel in between, and, and it's many of the same people who are doing the, the stops. But um, but it is it is particularly Ontario, and it's not happening in Quebec. Well, let's see how far afield from the uh, southern part of the province this goes. Emma, are you seeing the kinds of ugly demonstrations that we've seen in and around the Greater Toronto Area in southwestern Ontario? We haven't seen them here yet, but uh, it's important to note that Justin Trudeau hasn't uh, come to the area uh, since the launching of the campaign. Only Jack Meet Singh has um, visited uh, Windsor, Essex. So you haven't seen it. All right, David, how about to you in Northern Ontario? Anything the likes of which we've seen in, in Bolton or in Cambridge? Uh, to some degree, uh, during the last year, we have seen some anti-lockdown protests, uh, some anti-vaccine protests uh, here in North Bay down at our waterfront. A lot of people uh, broke the uh, masking and social distancing rules. There were tickets handed out. But were they as angry and violent as the people we've seen during the campaign? No. So there is a similar sentiment, but the, uh, I guess, level of anger and vitriol wouldn't be the same. Emma, how about in southwestern Ontario? Any anti-vax protests that have been particularly noteworthy during the campaign? Not during the campaign, but prior to the campaign, there were a few, but uh, no more than 30 people. So nothing, uh, uh, not a big phenomenon that we're seeing in the, G like we're seeing in the GTA. Interesting. All right, Aaron, what's Paulie got to say about the ugliness that we've seen on the hustings so far? Well, there's no question that the protesters are helping Trudeau's campaign. We are seeing a huge boost for Mr. Trudeau on the issue of protesters. Uh, as Susan mentioned, people really see the protesters. They're, they're liking them to the Capitol Hill protesters. They see them as American-style politics. Of course, it's, Canadian, it's very Canadian. But they also associate them with the conservative voters. They see this as this anti-vax group that Aaron O'Toole, because he he doesn't require mandatory vaccinations, even of his own candidates, they see them as part of that brand. And so it's a reminder of um, of what could happen if if these people got more um, you know, more support. And so every time Mr. Trudeau stands up to them, not just sympathy for Mr. Trudeau, but also this idea that he is defending democracy and he's defending Canadians from this, what they see as hooliganism. So it's definitely, they are definitely helping the liberal cause. Huh. Uh, Susan, let me fact check that, that with you. When you were at Cambridge and when you saw that demonstration, I mean, Aaron O'Toole has taken pains to say, there's no place in my campaign for those kinds of people. We don't want them. But is there a connection? No, I would, I, there's more of a connection to the People's Party of Canada. There are People's Party signs. Maxime Bernier has been whipping them up on Twitter. I, I just really want to say I, I feel uh, southwestern Ontario in London, where I spent many years of my life as a student, uh, there was a demonstration last night, um, and the, uh, the liberal leader was pelted with gravel. 
Uh, so it's making its way down down that way. And I noticed that Mark Emery, who when I was at Western a million years ago, um, was a, a, a pot activist based in London. He was goading them on, on Twitter uh, as well. So um, it, it's making its way down the 401 uh, as well, east and west. And, and when you said th th they're throwing stuff at the leader, is it always Justin Trudeau who's on the receiving end of this? None of the other leaders? I haven't seen these break out um, to the extent on the other campaigns. There is there is RCMP security around them for good reason, all the other leaders. And I think that goes to the fact that this is, it, it's not that they're anti-liberal, they're anti-government. And they are uh, lashing out at Trudeau because he is the leader. They are confused though too. They, uh, they don't know um, the difference between measures that Doug Ford has taken the vaccine passports are Doug Ford's thing, but Trudeau's getting blamed for those. Um, in Cambridge, I heard one yelling that they were furious that they'd received tickets, would have, would have been their municipality. So they're, they're, they're all over the map, literally and uh, ideologically. Uh, they don't make a whole lot of sense. I'm not going to repeat some of their wackier things they were saying, um, but they are dangerous, and they're, they're dangerous for democracy too. They, they, um, I, I don't, I would resist any effort to make light of what these are or to call them just some sort of scary fringe out there as well. They're organized and they're disturbing. Well, let me follow up on that. And David, I saw you nod your head when Susan said they're dangerous for democracy. Obviously, there are a lot of people who think that they are participating in democracy by doing this and that they are a part of democracy by doing this as opposed to a threat to democracy by doing this. What's your take on that, David? Yeah, I, I think it's hard not to see this as a, an extension of some of the uh, anti-elite sentiment uh, we associate with uh, Trumpism, and it's just being exported here in Ontario and Canada. Uh, we do see populism in people like Doug Ford, um, and you know he campaigned as an anti-elite, but really once he got into government, he really has listened to the elites, uh, mostly the scientists and doctors here, maybe to some disappointment of these uh, populist elements. Uh, so we've had populism in Canada on both the left and the right. This group of people feel as though they're empowered to say whatever they want um, in the name of democracy, in the name of free speech. But uh, really, with free speech, there comes a certain level of responsibility that, again, these protesters, if we want to call them that, uh, don't seem to understand or grasp. They never really have been educated in that area, I would say. Uh, so it is very disturbing, and it does remind me uh, uh, of the insurrection, as it was called, the capital uh, uh, protesters, the occupiers in the United States. So uh, do we really want to see that kind of element coming here to Canada? Have we seen that come to Canada? I think to some degree, yes, uh, empowered by American media and, and social media more broadly. I should say we're going to do a whole program on this on Monday, or we're going to do a significant part of our program on Monday on this, so um, I, I, I shouldn't overdo it on this part of the campaign tonight, but I still want to hear from Emma on whether or not she thinks that what we're seeing is a threat to democracy. What's your view on that? Well, it's very unfortunate that these protesters are resorting to intimidation and harassment to have their voices heard, but at the same time, none of the parties are... Um, are supporting their cause, right? So what these protests have, um, the outcome of these protests, I think, is to put the uh, attention on two issues, which is uh, mandatory um, vaccination and uh, vaccination passports, but also uh, on Trudeau's personal leadership. And I think these two issues are going to become the ballot questions for uh, the election. Aaron, I want to circle back with you now because you did say that the more these protesters are gaining traction and coverage, the better it is for Justin Trudeau. And I wonder if you could give us a little insight into what you're seeing in your data that reflects that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we have a graph that looks at the issues and poly um, signals where people are looking to vote in for one party or another based on that issue. And the protesters are number one in people wanting switching their vote to Justin Trudeau. We're also seeing that support for vaccine passports and mandatory vaccination have gone up 
over the course of the campaign. Now, whether that's because of these protests um, or just as vaccine passports get implemented, people have come to accept it. Um, these are all associated with the Liberal Party. And so we are seeing that the trend is toward wanting these things. And, um, and so I think it, it bodes well for the Liberals. And Susan, one last thing on this. In your travels among these protesters, do you, um, you ever notice anybody being arrested yet? Because certainly some of the things that I've seen, you would think cross the line. Some of the signs are incredibly profane. They're screaming at kids who are wearing masks. There's some pretty antisocial, I don't know if it's illegal, but, but you got to think it snuggles up to the line. How about that? Yeah, I've been wondering that myself, too. Uh, the, the, the police, I, I stood next to the police for a good couple of hours in Cambridge uh, during the demonstration, and they were there. I, I think the sense was that an arrest would have escalated the situation. So they were keeping people behind the private property line, uh, but nobody was making threats. I, I would imagine after the incident in London last night where where gravel was being thrown, uh, that, uh, that now we're headed into a territory where um, that some arrests are going to have to be made. And do I assume that campaign officials around Justin Trudeau are not permitted to say to the RCMP or the local police, hey, look at that, go arrest them? That's not on, I assume? No, no, that would, uh, we don't live in that kind of banana republic yet. Um, <laughs> Where, they, uh, where he can, the prime minister can order arrests, but uh, but I um, I think they're they're unnerved. Uh, the day again I was with them, the protesters followed the buses to the airport and came into the airport. Um, they're they're doing a lot of, and the, the bus was you know trying to do a snaking route uh, advised by the RCMP to not, not a car chase exactly, but um, but that's the sort of ridiculous state of things right now. Okay, let's uh, move on here. And uh, again, I want to start back in southwestern Ontario, uh, Emma, with you, because some of the great political fights in southwestern Ontario tend to be between Liberals and New Democrats, and the Conservatives often have not been big players at all. But when you see the Conservatives in first place in the polls nationally and, and even in the province of Ontario, as many pollsters have them right now, I'm wondering if you see signs of a reinvigorated Conservative Party that might actually take some seats this time. What do you think? Well, uh, if you look at the rural ridings in southwestern Ontario, they're leaning conservative. And this is not surprising because historically, these ridings have voted blue. And with uh, Erin O'Toole's Conservative Party on the rise in the poll, um, uh, they are going to continue being uh, blue. But I don't think the conservatives can make gains uh, in the area. Um, you have the NDP, uh, which is trying to regain two seats. It's It lost in the 2019 election. You have the writing of um, Windsor uh, Tecumseh uh, that went liberal. And you have the uh, uh, writing of Essex that went conservative. So um, the, the NDP is campaigning hard. And you also have the liberals who are trying to do inroads in the area. Uh, they are running um, former cabinet, uh, provincial cabinet minister Sandra Pupatello in Windsor West, and they've injected a uh, hundred of hundred uh, millions of dollars in the area. All right, David. How about in Northern Ontario? Do you see any kind of renaissance for the Conservative Party? Which you know, it's they they have won seats up there. They're capable of winning seats up there, but it doesn't happen often. Yeah, we have about 10 ridings that we count as uh, Northern Ontario ridings. And I think, yeah, I think the Conservatives could pick up at least a couple of new ridings. Uh, the NDP may also uh, make some gains. So right now we have six Liberals, two NDP and two Conservatives, and that could change. Uh, we could see a more even kind of uh, Northern Ontario as far as those three parties go. Um, so, you know, uh, for example, the Nickel Belt, I think, is one of the most interesting ones here in uh, Sudbury. Um, and that could, that could be an NDP pickup. That, that's quite possible. Uh, Sudbury riding itself could be uh, also an NDP pickup, but uh, I'm going to guess that the Liberal is going to eke it out there. The Conservatives have a good chance in the Sioux, though. I think that they, they might, might, in fact, gain a seat there and possibly in Thunder Bay, Rainy River. 
Um, Kenora, they already have that seat. Uh, the NDP are running fairly strong there, but uh, in all likelihood, um, the Conservatives will hang on. Now, let me follow up with you on that, David, because you, you've mentioned a few seats there that the Conservatives hold provincially. Uh, the Sioux, Kenora, uh, the seat you're in, Nipissing right now. The Conservatives have all those seats provincially. Uh, we know that from time to time, people like to hedge their bets in Ontario. They put one party in power provincially and a different one federally. Do you see evidence of that this time? It's really so many toss-ups, Steve. I mean, it's very hard to, to, to know if that's going to happen. I mean, you're right. We sort of vote one way provincially and then another way federally. Here in my riding, uh, federally, we have, of course, Anthony Rhoda, um, who, who was Speaker of the House, who may be again. We'll see. Um, and have run strong in this riding previously. We've seen the NDP actually trend up. So it's hard It's hard for me to kind of agree with you just on the face of it, just because there are, of the 10 ridings, five of them are close or even toss-ups. So I'm not so sure. Gotcha. Aaron, um, I want to just go through with you relatively quickly, if we can, a series of issues that have been hot, and I want to know if they still are. For example... Uh, on the day that Justin Trudeau called the election, Afghanistan blasted into the headlines. Is Afghanistan still, a few weeks later, as strong an issue affecting people's voting decisions? No, it's come, it's come very far down. It's still there, um, but it's come down quite a bit. All right. Uh, how about the issue of mandatory vaccinations? Is that, is that the, the cleavage among different parts of the electorate that the Liberals would like it to be? Yes, it is. And vaccine passports more than mandatory vaccines, but both of them are going up, especially vaccine passports, obviously, because provinces are implementing them. Uh, but that also has an effect on mandatory passports. That is going up as an issue. And it favors, well, it, it, it tends to be more of a partisan issue, though. So if you believe in them, you believe in, you know, you lean toward one party. So I don't see it as a swing issue, or Polly doesn't see it as a swing issue, but it's definitely increasing, and it's tied to the protesters as well. All right. Is there a sleeper issue out there that perhaps we are not uh, aware of that's having more impact than perhaps we realize? Yeah, we've done a, a ranking of issues that are important among swing voters. And I think the swing voters, as we heard, there's a large pool of them and they're very important. And these issues in there that we've not heard at all in this campaign are things like immigration, um, racism, climate change, of course, and abortion tops that list. So these are issues that swing voters are considering. And I think that the uh, debate coming up this week is gonna be really, really important in deciding how some of these swing voters go. I'm going to get to the debates in a second, but I want to hit on a couple of more issues here. When the Liberals talk child care, you know, of course, they've been signing these agreements with provinces uh, over the last many months. And Aaron O'Toole, the Conservative leader, even though asked many times, has yet to commit as to whether or not he'll leave those agreements in place or do something else. What is Pauly saying about those splits on the issue of child care? Daycare is really, really important in this election. And People don't understand or don't like Aaron O'Toole's tax breaks for daycare. Uh, people really want to see the $10 a day daycare as people are talking about. So it really, really favors the Liberals. All right, last one, guns. We've seen again, the Liberals try to create a kind of a wedge with the Conservatives on the issue of assault rifles, AR-15s, guns over the last few days. How's that resonating? Discussion about this issue is definitely going up, but we're seeing it falling along partisan lines. So if you are a conservative, you think it's okay what the conservatives are proposing. If you're a liberal and you were never going to vote conservative anyway, you're very incensed by this issue. So far, we haven't seen it cross party lines, but we'll see after the debate if it, if it manages to swing those swing voters. Okay, going to pick up on the debate now. And Susan, that takes me to you. Tomorrow and is it tomorrow and Thursday, the two leaders debates? If I got that right? Yeah. Tomorrow and Thursday, the two leaders debates, French and English. And I mean, I presume this is really the last opportunity that all the party leaders have who are participating. Maxime Bernier is not, but who are participating in this date in this debate to to reset the narrative. So set the stakes for us, if you would. They're massive for especially Aaron O'Toole and for Justin Trudeau. I would say that Jagmeet Singh has had a very good campaign. He's probably going to be as likable in the debates as he was. He has been on the ground. Um, I would say that, that it is, I, I would imagine there are white knuckles in the back rooms of the Conservatives 
and liberals for these, these debates. Justin Trudeau has to rescue or pull this, this campaign back from the brink of losing power. And Aaron O'Toole has to persuade Canadians that he is the progressive, reasonable guy who has managed to attract uh, a, a significant amount of support and momentum in this campaign. The, these debates could actually change momentum for both of them. Um, and I, I, both of them, I think, would be worried. Emma, what will you be looking for at the two debates? Well, uh, for Justin Trudeau, he will need to give the performance of his life uh, during uh, the French and the English debates uh, this week. Um, he is right now, I would say, in panic mode. He was supposed to uh, campaign on a recovery plan, and now he's been focusing on these wedge issues like abortions, uh, gun control, uh, vaccination mandates, etc. So he needs to appear um, in control of the situation. He needs to sell what he's done over the last uh, six years. And David, maybe I can get you to follow up just by focusing on, uh, let's say, the smallest party that's participating in this debate. Annemie Paul's had a really tough time. Her party has been on fire, and I don't mean that in a good way, with internecine rivalries and so on. Uh, I mean, this is her last chance to make her case to the Canadian people, I presume. Yeah, you have to. You have to feel bad for her in a way. She kind of came into a party that was falling apart all around her. They're not even going to be able to run um, 338 candidates. I, and I don't know the number they actually settled on, but it's well short of a, a full slate of candidates. So, so they're already sort of conceding that, uh, you know, ha as well as they did last time around, winning three seats, it seems as though they may be lucky to win one. Uh, and any hope of growth seems quite distant. Uh, will this help the NDP? That's kind of what we would normally say. But, you know, the green voter is kind of a strange beast. It may, it, it may go any number of directions. And so um, I'm not sure if the NDP will necessarily benefit from this green collapse. Does she have to give the performance of her life, as uh, Emma has said about Justin Trudeau? Well, absolutely. And in essence, she'll have to introduce herself to Canadians. Most Canadians really don't know anything about her, haven't seen her speak. So uh, I guess she has a chance to uh, save uh, a, a complete collapse of her party uh, this time around by a good debate performance. In our last minute here, and Aaron, I'm going to save it for you because... You've been on this program before many of the last elections, and we always remind people, pollsters tell people what, what people thought yesterday. They don't necessarily predict uh, what's going to happen two weeks from now. But Polly does this. Polly does predict on the basis of all of the data that she chews on where she thinks it's ultimately going. At what point will you give us Polly's call? Oh, my goodness. I'm hoping three days before the election. I'll have a better idea after the debate. Uh, the debate is essential. I don't think there's been a debate that's been more important. Um, for this one, what we're seeing is, even though the Conservatives are ahead, even in Polly's seat count, the issues that are important to Canadians and are increasingly important favor the Liberals. So that's why it's, a, it's really difficult to call it this time. We have a lot of swing voters. So ask me next week. <laughs> um, but Right now, I'd say it's anybody's election between those two parties. It's, it's very close. Well, if I recall, you came on a few days before the last federal election wearing red, and that was my first clue that I knew who you were going to predict. Have you got, uh, you know, the red wardrobe, the blue wardrobe? I don't know, maybe the orange wardrobe standing by? I, I've got both standing by. <laughs> it's gotcha. too early to call it this All point. right. We will call on you when necessary then. Uh, my thanks to Aaron Kelly, Susan Delacourt, David Tabachnik, Emma Riche for coming on to TVO tonight. Thanks so much for starting our 16th season in such style, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Ontario students go back to school on different days across the province this week, but they all return to class with lasting effects from the longest school shutdowns in the country and a fourth wave of COVID-19 rising. With us on what to watch for, both in Ontario's capital city, Annie Kidder, Executive Director of People for Education, and Caroline Alfonso, Education Reporter for the Global Mail. Welcome to you both. 
Thanks nice for having us. Thank you. Uh, let me just get us started by saying, in the interest of full disclosure, that TVO is a provider of the province's distance and online learning. Not the agenda or the journalistic side of the organization, but the ILC, the Independent Learning Center, which has been a distance learning partner with the Ministry of Education for almost 100 years. And as I mentioned in the opening, schools are reopening this week, but some schools have already been open since last week, I believe. Um, so, Caroline, let me get started with you. The Ontario government announced their back-to-school plan in early August. What's different from their back-to-school plan now compared to 2020? Well, Nam, some of those measures that we saw last year are still in place, like masking and cohorting with your class. But there's a lot of the restrictions that we saw last year that are not in place anymore. Among them, um, their assemblies are allowed. Uh, kids can go outside to play at recess with different cohorts. Uh, one of the big things is extracurriculars uh, can be back. Um, and the other thing is that music class is allowed. So kids can sing indoors. Uh, as long as they're distanced, uh, they can play instruments. But you have to remember that even though they have allowed this to happen, boards have took it upon themselves to keep some of those restrictions in place from last year. So at the Toronto board, for example, even though the province has said extracurriculars are allowed to return, the TDSB has said, well, we're going to see how to do that. We haven't uh, we haven't decided as yet how to bring them back. I'm glad you brought that up because, um, you know, we're seeing that different boards, depending on where you live in Ontario, uh, different boards have different rules. And Annie, we were waiting, parents were waiting for most of the summer for these announcements. And when they came in early August, what did you think? Well, I think you're you're right that there are different boards, different even schools sometimes with different rules. So, uh, and Caroline's right that a lot of them were the same. Um, there is a difference between what you can say kind of from on high in the ministry and the, the reality of how you organize that on the ground. So I think a number of boards have said, before we start doing sports outside, things like football, any kind of high contact sports, we're going to wait a while to see how this is going to play out. Um, because we don't know about people's vaccination status, there is a real worry uh, from, from parents and from families too. Do I want my child participating in a high contact sport, not knowing how everybody's doing? So I think that boards are trying as best they can uh, to figure out for their own boards how they're going to implement this. But there definitely have been pieces missing and a little bit confusion about how are principals supposed to handle uh, some of the things that have been announced. What's missing? What else is missing? Well, uh, a vaccination strategy would have been nice. Um, I think a lot of us, I, we have been calling on uh, the ministry to add um, COVID-19 to the list of, of diseases that's in the um, uh, Immunization of School Pupils Act. Uh, there are a lot of other diseases for which it's mandatory for kids to be vaccinated, but COVID's not there. Uh, so that's not there right now. Um, there was something announced just on Friday, sent out to boards explaining that teachers who chose not to be vaccinated had to be tested twice a week. Principals are really unclear about, am I supposed to know who's vaccinated, who's not? Um, because it make, makes a difference in terms of, you know, what happens uh, if there's COVID. So there's a lot of kind of muddy space in there that particularly has to do with, it's one thing to, you know, write things down on a piece of paper. It's another to actually implement them uh, in a school. And I think that the, the, the vaccination status and vaccination, mandatory vaccinations, are two of the biggest things missing. And the other missing piece really has to do with the, the educational uh, uh, strategies going forward. Well, we'll get into that in just a, a few mm -hmm. moments, but I want to stick on the uh, vaccine um, status and the policy. Uh, two weeks after the government announced that back-to-school plan for this year, they also announced a vaccine policy for teachers and other public employees, which includes antigen uh, screening for those who can't or choose not to get vaccinated. Do you think that policy helped alleviate some of the stress for parents um, who were feeling uh, regardless, regarding going back to the class this fall. Caroline, I'll start with you. I think what I'm hearing from parents is still a lot of anxiousness, especially parents who have kids who are 12 and under, or who are under 12, actually. 
Um, so I, what I'm hearing from parents that I've spoken with is that they would have preferred mandatory vaccinations in schools for those who are eligible to protect kids in this fourth wave. So my my sense from what I've been from what I'm hearing is that they don't feel like it goes far enough. But for now, I mean, a disclosure form um, and by uh, twice weekly testing for unvaccinated staff. It's a step, I think, for some parents. Um, we're dealing with uh, the fourth wave and what has been called the most contagious variant. Any, um, will parents even know if the teachers that their student, their children have are vaccinated? Well, this is, a, you know, this is a, a really good question, and will principals know as well? Um, so, yes, it's a step that was taken. It was taken very, very late. That step could have been taken at least a month ago. And it doesn't deal with the need for mandatory vaccinations. And I think it's interesting that even the unions have said, we think vaccinations should be mandatory. So this testing thing is really, to because even when you make vaccinations mandatory, there still can be, if you have a real medical reason, you don't have to get vaccinated. But by saying you can get vaccinated, or if you don't want to, you can just get tested twice a week, we're not really uh, ensuring that everybody who can be is vaccinated. There is no way for a parent to know. And principals are saying, well, we're actually not allowed to ask, but we do need to know because we need to know if people are getting tested twice a week as they're supposed to be. Um, and we need to know because there's actually different protocols even now um, in terms of who has to isolate and who doesn't have to isolate depending on their vaccination status, except nobody has to tell anybody their vaccination status. Uh, we kind of have a sense of how parents are feeling about this vaccine policy. We shouldn't also forget that some teachers are also parents. Caroline, do we know how teachers are feeling about this vaccine policy? Well, I mean, just Annie just mentioned that the teachers unions, the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario, for example, called for mandatory vaccines for all the eligible populations in schools. I think, you know, just like in society, you're gonna get divergent opinions about this. There are educators who feel that teachers should, uh, they should be vaccinated if they're teaching in schools and the students as well that are eligible should be vaccinated. And there's others who feel quite the opposite. I think that's just re a reflection of what's happening in the wider society. Uh, Annie, at the beginning, you mentioned that some of the things that are missing, and that was one to have uh, va COVID vaccines on the list of mandatory vaccines for students. Do we know where we are on that? Because TDSP school trustees unanimously voted for that. They unanimously voted to ask for it. But this is a case where um, it's, I think it's harder for individual boards to decide this. It really has to be part of the act, which is a provincial act. It, to me, and maybe I'm wrong, it seems as if it would be very easy to just add COVID to that list. And I think they're going to anyway. And I think this is part of the frustration is that there's been a lot of kind of playing catch up uh, in Ontario in terms of, you know, even looking at the uh, proof of vaccination certificates, which it was like, we're never going to do this. Okay, now we are going to do it. And I think adding COVID uh, to the list of diseases would really help. And I think that boards this is one area where I don't think boards can just do this on their own. Um, and it is, in terms of confidence in schools, people's feeling about their kids going back to school, this would really be a big help. Uh, Caroline? I think, you know, uh, now I'm feeling a sense of deja vu again uh, from last fall where everything was really last minute and it seems like it's really last minute again. Yeah. So the TDSB has this mandatory vaccine policy, but the details have not been worked out. So we don't know the dates of, you know, when teachers have to have their first dose. Um, I'm going to just draw you to Ottawa Carleton where trustees passed a mandatory vaccination policy. I want to say last week or the week before, Nam, everything is a blur in the pandemic, yeah. the weeks and days. But they said the teachers, education staff have to be vaccinated, have their first dose by September 20th, and then the second dose by required time. And they've actually said that there would be some penalties for those who do not uh, receive oh, their vaccines, including um, an unpaid leave, possible unpaid leave. So... I say the details are still being worked out, but we're hearing sort of noise from a couple of boards on how they're going to proceed in this way. Um, you know, I, I want to... Uh... 
schools haven't been in class since April. And as you mentioned, Caroline, um, it's the sense of deja vu. It seems to be very last minute. Annie, um, we've been out of class since April. Schools start, have already started in some parts of Ontario, mm -hmm. and they're starting this week. Um, is there, do we have an idea why we are where we are now? Um, it seems as if we didn't learn the lessons from last year. I don't even know how to answer that. Yes, it does seem a bit like that. I know that, you know, I was doing press conferences from a cottage in August uh, this year, and I thought, oh, I was doing the same press conference last year about how important it is to be ready. I, I'm not sure uh, wh what the reluctance is to have more detailed plans in uh, across the board in terms of education, in terms of, you know, assessment, staff, everything. We're even missing some funding announcements in terms of back to school. So I can't answer uh, why we're not there and why we're doing this all at the last minute, but definitely definitely is uh, problematic. Um, I want to show you a clip from a segment that we did on Friday. We spoke to some parents and their experiences of parenting during this pandemic. And this is one parent's experience with online learning. My oldest and my middle, so they are going in grade 12 and grade 10 this year. And the same thing, my middle just coasted through grade 9. Um, it was every quadmester, different calls from different teachers, you know, He's not turning on the camera. He's not paying attention. What can we do? And it just, we felt really helpless because there's really nothing we could do. It was just coping with the situation. And then my youngest, very similar to Tess, um, couldn't get him to engage, tantrums, um, constant like redirection to pay attention. And then it got to a point where I just said, can you give me the lesson plan and I'll just do it alone with him because it was just too much. Uh, that's Joanne Payne, and she's a parent, and her kids go to school in Peel District. Uh, Caroline, from what she said, how typical is that? What, is that something that you're hearing from other parents? So typical, Nam. I mean, so many children had students had such a difficult time last year, just moving back and forth between home and school. And then when schools shut down to in-class learning in April, you know, in Sudbury and Thunder Bay was in March. It was just a tough time. And, you know, from even teachers, I heard how many students disengaged from their learning in the sense that they did not turn their camera on. They signed in for class in the morning and perhaps were not there for the rest of the day. They had just moved on. It was it was a difficult time for for many, many children. And that that voice is typical of a of the frustration of a lot of parents. Um, it seems that uh, for day to day, for my kids anyway, it was just about getting through the day and getting the work done. Maybe not well, but just getting the work done. Uh, Annie, is there any concrete data that show what the learning loss has been like for students here in this province? Well, and, and, you know, really you have to start with, you know, how are we defining learning loss? And is learning loss, you know, a change in your math score? Or, you know, should we be thinking about learning in a, in a more expansive way? There, it has been worrying, uh, the, the lack of data and the lack of research. Um, but it would be dangerous to go. We just needed to do more testing to understand, again, where kids were in math. Um, and I think that those parents, you know, everybody that I've talked to has said similar things. And what we know from some data is a that it had this it had a different effect on different families and different kids. So for kids who were already struggling, uh, this was an incredibly difficult situation, and there will be learning loss, quote unquote. Um, for kids who have tons of support at home who weren't struggling, they actually may be able to sort of get things back together quite quickly. But it, this is partly what makes how we're starting the school year and how we're thinking of this whole year incredibly important where we can't just assume, okay, curriculum, you start on the first day, it's great, you know, whatever, three, you got to learn your times tables. We have to think about um, do, uh, having the supports in place, having time to do really broad assessments of how kids are in terms of their learning, in terms of their education overall, in terms of their mental health, their well-being, um, because there are, you know, all the, ki the kids those parents described, I think that's, that's very common. So it's good. The, the period of adjustment will be big uh, going back to school. Um, the ministry announced way back in May that online learning will be an option for September. So I'm sure there's a lot of people wondering why is there no data on this, whether or not online learning has been a success. Caroline? 
That's a great point, Nam. There has not been data on it, but you have to remember that that period of online learning or what we went through over the past year was emergency remote learning, right? So mm -hmm. it was not sort of the way online learning would probably be typically rolled out to study. But, you know, we even in an emergency phase, what is lacking is any data on I understand attendance, it's hard to measure in an online learning environment, but there's no data that we've seen on that. There's no data on how kids have fared um, provincially. I mean, we have some a local snapshot. The Toronto board, I have mm -hmm. to say, has been phenomenal in producing some of this data on how kids are doing. And one of the things that they showed is that in grade one, I believe, in their January report cards, both online learners and those who were in person had fallen back, had moved back um, over that over the during the course of the pandemic. But other than that, we're really lacking in showing how kids have actually fared, other than anecdotally or through parent surveys. Well, we do know that um, more kids are going back to in-class learning. More parents have opted for their kids to go back than they did last year. Um, so. When it comes to what teachers are go how teachers are going to engage, uh, Annie, how do you think teachers are going to deal with the fact that their students aren't where they should be when they do return to class? Well, I think that, that that goes back to to what I said, which is that what we have to make sure of is that teachers aren't being asked to act as if, you know, great, we're back to normal. Um, and that there, you know, we still have funding things that haven't been announced yet in terms of will there be extra supports for, for teachers, other kinds of support staff. So teachers need time to assess. And this is hopefully, uh, to Caroline's point, you know, where the research will come from because there will need to be a lot of various kinds of assessments at the beginning of the year for, you know, that'll take a month or two to, to do one-on-one -on -one so that we have a really rich idea of where kids are. And I want to add one more thing. So we just did a scan of uh, what everybody was doing all across the country. And what's interesting is that in most provinces, online learning isn't a choice. And I want to make that clear because it's it's interesting that Ontario decided to keep it there, even for kids in kindergarten. But in most other provinces, you have to have a medical reason that you're not going back to school. And that, too, may have an impact on education that we need to understand and we need to have data and research looking at who's choosing it, why are they choosing it, and does it uh, create an advantage or a disadvantage. Um, you know, holding kids back a year is no longer something that the school boards do. I know I've tried. Um, should we <laughs> should we be rethinking that, um, Caroline? I I don't think so. I think you know teachers do a really incredible job of, of um, making sure kids are assessed. So it happens every year when kids return back to school where teachers sort of understand that kids are learning at different levels in their classroom, right? And they, they bring them up, they help them along. Um, it's just going to be more pronounced this year in the sense that, you know, teachers know that the past year and a half has been a mix of online and in-person class for many kids. So I'm not sure holding kids back is the right approach uh, to learning for a whole host of reasons, but um, I think teachers can do a fairly good job at helping most kids um, reach their potential in some way. And Annie? No, I agree. I think that the reason we don't do it anymore is that the evidence was that it that it didn't work as a strategy, that it actually, that kids were less likely to be successful. It was hard for a whole host of reasons in terms of their, um, where they were socially, all of those things. But we have to make sure, on the other hand, that we're not just sort of leaping into a kind of sink or swim idea of this year. And that for kids who are struggling because of having had a very hard year last year, again, we have to make sure that there's time and space and support um, to provide them with what they need in order to, and it's not just to get caught up because education doesn't work in that kind of totally linear way, but it's to get themselves back into the right space so that they are where they should be in terms of their, their overall grade level. Uh, we know that high school students are in a modified system. Uh, is, it, is that making it harder uh, for them? There's concerns of kids maybe falling behind and not being able to catch up. Caroline? Um, so many school boards moved to the modified calendar as opposed to the quadmaster, which was 
which was, from my understanding, hated by many parents and students and teachers. Um, and a modified calendar, semester calendar, means that they're doing four courses at a time, except they're doing two courses one week, two courses the other week. Um, I think it's a better system for many students um, in the way that they learn and that the fact that they can be in school more often and for the full day. Um, and I think it will, you know, I think everybody wants to go back to the way it was. And but this allows school boards to if if we were to move online again, and Nam, I'm crossing my fingers that that does not happen for my own children. Same. Um, but if we were to move online again, I think a mo modified semester calendar just makes it easier for boards and teachers to be able to teach the curriculum. We have um, 40 seconds left, and I just wanted to get from both of you. What are your biggest concerns about this fall? Annie, I'll start with you. You've got 20 seconds. Oh, I, I think the lack of educational plan and a worry that we're going to end up doing just to the sort of narrow basics and not really take this opportunity to learn from the pandemic and change how we do uh, parts of school going forward. And Caroline? I, I also hope there would be a better education plan in helping children sort of adapt to be back in the classroom. I also have two young kids in the system, Nam, and, you know, having such a disrupted year last year was not good for them and many other children. I just hope that we can do it better this year. Uh, Groundhog Day needs to end. Uh -huh. um, thank you so much <laughs> for your insights. We really do appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Nam. And that is the agenda for Tuesday, September 7th, 2021, the first program in this, our 16th season on TVO. The U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan last month left both countries, and this one, with many unanswered questions. Tomorrow, we'll consider what lessons were learned and what lies ahead. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.